A few years ago, um, God started to work in my heart and, and started to impress on me some things that I was seeing in uh, the church in America and uh, quite honestly in our own church. And I felt like, uh, and I talked about this a couple weeks ago, I felt like what we were seeing across our country uh, was just a catastrophic failure of discipleship within the church as people were drifting in all kinds of different ways. And so um, I just said, hey, Lord, this is, if we've not done what you want us to do, then, then I wanna you know, do whatever it is that you want us to do. And so we kind of started on that back in, I guess it was 2020. Uh, when all of that was kind of being pressed on me. And I thought, I don't know exactly what to do or what our next steps are. And so I finally uh, reached out to, uh, to somebody and uh, started having some conversations. And eventually those conversations led into a mentorship, Bobby uh, Harrington, who is the author of the book that we're uh, reading through as a church right now. And I just said, hey, I, just help me navigate uh, this season that we're in as a church. And, uh, and so he started doing that. Uh, and he recommended, um, he recommended that I read a book. And, uh, and so I did. It was, it's, it's this book right here. It's called Disciple Shift. It's something that he wrote with a, with a friend of his by the name of Jim Putman, who I have uh, become, since become friends with also. Um, but he said, I want you to you know, read that book and just think through it. And so I did. I, I read the book. I took our staff through the book. I took our elders through the book. Uh, we took a group of men through the book, and we just, uh, for a number of weeks, we just, you know, read through this and thought, you know, what, what is God trying to say to us as a church? Uh, and what I want to do today, as, as, as I begin this message, I want to read you the uh, a, a kind of couple paragraphs out of the foreword who, uh, by Robert Coleman, who is the author of uh, The Master Plan of Evangelism. Uh, he wrote that a number of decades ago, uh, and it sold, I don't know, maybe four million copies over the years. It's, uh, uh, it's just a great uh, book. But this is what uh, Robert Coleman writes uh, in the foreword. He's also got some snippets throughout the book, but he says this. And I just thought this resonated with me when I read it. Um, Something is missing in the life of the church. Today's institution has a polite form of religion, but it seems to lack power the power to radically change the wayward course of our society. This is not to say that there's nothing worthwhile happening in the church. In fact, all kinds of things are going on. And if success is measured by big meetings and big buildings and big budgets, then the church appears to be doing quite well. But the real question has to be asked, is all this busyness actually fulfilling the mandate of Christ to make disciples and teaching them in turn to do the same? That's the mission of the church. Yes, uh, we, want a, uh, we want churches to grow, but it is becoming painfully evident that getting more people on the rolls has not produced or has not resulted in a corresponding increase in transformed lives. Where do you find the contagious sacrifice and all-out commitment to the Great Commission? In our obsession with bigger numbers of converts, far too little attention has been given to the nurture of believers in how to live their faith. This neglect has created a crisis in the contemporary church. How we deal with it, I believe, represents the most important issue we face today. That was written in 2013. Uh, he was ahead of the game on that and has been ahead of the game for a really long time. And so uh, we started this series a couple of weeks ago about what is it that we're supposed to be doing as a church? Uh, wh what is it that every church uh, is supposed to be doing? And so uh, we really acknowledged in the first week of the series that there's been this, this like huge um, you know, failure of discipleship, of helping people follow Jesus, sold out 100% to Jesus, sold out, not being dragged down by uh, the culture around us or being swayed by the culture around us, but staying true and faithful uh, to Jesus. And um, our way of doing church, especially in the West, especially in the United States, has, has not produced the kind of uh, disciples, I think, that Jesus wants to produce. And so um, I, I've, over the last couple of years, just really thought through this and said, okay, Lord, if my leadership has been lacking in this way, then I want to repent of that and, and do what, is, uh, what you feel is we should be doing. And so that's kind of where we are right now. And when we talk about discipleship, when we talk about discipleship, we, we're really talking about um, 
the process of helping people trust Jesus and follow him with everything they've got. Like they totally trust Jesus, not just for their eternity, but for everything that happens in their life, and that they're following him regardless of the cost. And uh, for a lot of us, uh, that's not kind of where we've been. And for a lot of churches uh, in the United States of America, in Canada, um, that's not where people have been. Now, you'll find that kind of devotion to Jesus in, you know, the church in Africa and Muslim countries and China and North Korea, but uh, it's lacking in us. And I think that's more reflection of the way that we've approached church and we've gotten out of sorts. Uh, and so we're just kind of saying, okay, Lord, uh, you know, what do you want? And so um, the kind of thing that we're talking about, discipling other people, is not done in a classroom setting. It's not done uh, with another class. It's not done with another seminar. It is done, as we've been looking at, it's done in the context of relationships. And we're going to drill down on that a little bit more today. And so uh, last week, we really uh, looked at this question, uh, what is a disciple? I mean, we've got a lot of um, answers to, you know, what is a Christian in our day? I mean, we, you know, people got all kinds of ideas. But if someone were to ask you, are you a disciple? How would you even think about how to answer that. What, what is a disciple? And so uh, we looked at a statement of Jesus, uh, of his invitation uh, for Peter and Andrew and James and John to follow him. And what we found is that the invitation to follow Jesus is the definition itself of a disciple. And so we looked last week at Mark chapter 1, verse 17, at this uh, invitation of Jesus to these first followers, these first disciples. And he says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And we broke this verse down into three segments. Uh, the first is the follow me and I will make you become and fishers of men. And in this statement of Jesus, we find the definition of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus is someone uh, who is following Jesus. In other words, this is a decision of their will. This is a head decision. This is a decision where they say, I understand who Jesus is, and I am 100% surrendering my life to him to follow him. He is Lord, I'm not. He's in front, I'm not. He makes the decisions, I follow his decisions. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And when, and when the apostles, the, the first disciples, left all to follow Jesus, they weren't arguing with Jesus about which way they should go or where they should travel or what. They just said, Lord, you lead and we will follow. That's what a disciple of Jesus is. It's someone uh, who is following Jesus. They've made a decision with their head, with their mind, their will. I am following Jesus, full stop. And then this next phrase is Jesus says, and I will make you become. And in this process, what we realize is that Jesus is saying, uh, I'm gonna change you, I'm gonna transform you into something that you're currently not. And so a disciple of Jesus is one who is being changed by Jesus. It's not something, you can't change yourself. The change comes from Jesus. It comes from the power of the spirit in your life. And so if you are a disciple of Jesus, it means, it means that you literally are being transformed into a new and a different person. That transformation goes throughout your life. And some of you, uh, you've experienced this transformation, like you were living in a, in a way, but when you came to Jesus and surrendered to him, all of a sudden, internally, things started to change. Your desires began to change. Some of you have known people uh, who were one type of person and then all of a sudden they came to Jesus and their whole life turned around. And you're like, oh my goodness, that's the miracle of life change, but this is a person. They're following Jesus, they're being changed by Jesus, and then we found that this last phrase, fishers of men, I will make you become fishers of men. In other words, a disciple is someone who is committed to the mission of Jesus. That instead of saying, it's all about my agenda and my plans for the future and my little kingdom, I have, all of that goes, takes a backseat to what the mission of Jesus is. Like what Jesus, and really honestly, folks, and we've talked about this before, the reality is, is that this life comes to a close. And when this life comes to a close, either when you die or in a thousand years from now, all of us will stand before Jesus and give an account for what we did in this life. And if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, he's gonna to wanna to know, how did you follow in and, and uh, be a part of 
the mission that I called you to. And that mission is making disciples. And so uh, this is what we found, right? Uh, a disciple is one who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. And we said, as a church, as we move forward, uh, next slide, as a church, as we move forward, this is how we define what a disciple is. Coming from the lips of Jesus, taking that verse and expanding that verse, but a disciple is one who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. The following is the head decision. The being changed by Jesus, that's what's happening in a person's heart. So head, heart, and then committed to the mission of Jesus, that's what I'm doing with my hands. That's God is calling me, and so now I'm working in his kingdom for his mission. So head, heart, hands, they're all involved in this. Now, I, just to kind of go in a different direction for just a second, I want to ask you this question. Um, what draws people to seek to attend a church? What is it that when people say, you know, I think I want to go to church, what is it that they're seeking? Are they seeking a show? Are they seeking something for their kids? Are they seeking business contacts because they just started a business and they got to find some people to pass out their business cards? Or, you know, is it a country club? Is it the, where all the cool people are? Is it, why, why do people go? And some people are like, yeah, that's why I'm here. You know, I'm one of the cool people, obviously. Um, and there are a lot of reasons, I think. Some are not so good reasons, but at the end, if you peel all those layers back, this is what I think people are looking for. I think people want to connect with God when they go to a church. They want to have a sense of, I, I sense the presence of God that day. In some way, um, God spoke to me. In some way, something happened on the inside, and, and I think that's why they come, re regardless of you know, how it is that they get to a, any church, I think they're looking for an experience with God, a connection with God. And also, I think people in some way, they're like, you know what, I, there's this spiritual aspect of my life that just is, it's dying on the vine, and, and I, I would like to grow spiritually in some way. And so, I would like to connect spiritually. And I think these are some of the primary reasons why people, whether they can identify those or not, but that's what they're, 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 they're wanting that. Now, when we talk about spiritual growth or spiritual connection, what does it mean? What does it mean to grow spiritually? What does it mean to grow spiritually? And we could define that in a whole lot of ways. I, what I would like to do is I would like to define it by what it's not because this is typical. This is how people think when it comes to, oh, who's a spiritually mature person? A lot of times uh, people identify spiritual maturity with spiritual knowledge. In other words, uh, this is a person who knows a lot about the Bible, who can quote book, chapter, and verse. They know about theology, and they're, you know, they're all over the, I mean, they got it all down. And a lot of times, especially when I grew up, I just thought if, if somebody knew the Bible really well, that means that they were a spiritual giant. Not so much. I mean, Bible knowledge is good. Knowing a theology about God and uh, you know, all, the, that, all that's great. But just because you know the scriptures, just because you have spiritual knowledge doesn't mean that you are spiritually mature. Another thing, it's, it's not religious activity. A lot of people look at somebody else and say, oh man, they're, they're, uh, they're helping this group of people. They're already involved in that. They're going over here and they're, they're building this. They're involved. In, every time the church doors are open, they're there. I mean, they're, they're like a spiritual giant. They're, they're spiritually mature. But uh, religious activity, regardless of how you know, good it is, does not necessarily indicate spiritual growth or maturity. I mean, you've known people uh, in your life who have known a lot about the Bible and been very active in their church, but they're just quite frankly a jerk, right? Now, don't, don't look at the person sitting next to you. That's not, that's not what you should do, all right? I saw some of you like... <laughs> um, spiritual growth and maturity is also not <laughs> moral restraint, like, just because you stopped cussing doesn't mean you're spiritually mature, all right? I mean, just because you've, like, uh, you've gotten a little bit more moral in your life does not mean that you're spiritually mature. And a lot of people can 
stop cussing and stop, you know, doing a lot of different things, but that does not necessarily mean that they have grown spiritually. It just means they stopped doing some stuff. So if those things aren't spiritual growth or maturity, then how do we, how do we measure spiritual growth and maturity? There's one, there's one thing that we measure it by, and that is uh, Christ-likeness. How much is a person growing to be more and more like Jesus? Like when you see somebody, you say, you know what? Oh, gosh, they, it seems like they just spend time with Jesus. Like I, I, I knew him a few years ago, but now they're like a whole different person. And if a person is growing in their Christ-likeness, do you think... Do you think that they will have been growing in their understanding and reading and knowledge and interaction with the scriptures? Of course. Do you think if someone who's becoming more like Jesus, do you think that they will be serving other people and using their gifts in ministry? Of course. Do you think if someone who is growing in their Christ likeness, do you think that their moral life will have an adjustment to it? Of course. But those things aren't the definition of spiritual growth and maturity. Uh, they may be an indicator, but the, the real thing is what is happening in a person's heart? Is their character changing? Are their motives changing? Is their love growing? That's Christ likeness. That's Christ likeness. And that's exactly when you say, you know, well, what does God want out of my life? What does God want? For, I mean, like, oh, yes, I want to follow Jesus, but what does God want out of my life? This is what Romans chapter. 8 verse 29, this is a chapter a lot of people love, but this is what the Apostle Paul writes. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed to the what? Image of his son. In other words, uh, God wants you to grow to become more and more like Jesus. Go back one slide. That's what he wants. In fact, uh, in Galatians chapter uh, 4 verse 19, the apostle Paul writes to the church uh, in the city of Galatia and he says, my children, I am again suffering in labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. Paul understood, hey, the thing that God wants is for you to become more and more like Jesus, for your life to be conformed to his image. In uh, the book of Genesis, we find uh, that God created uh, humankind in his image. He created, you know, all things, but, but when it came to the human race, he said, I, I'm creating you in my image. And then Adam and Eve fell into sin and the image of God in them was marred, was tainted as a result of their sin. And so God sends Jesus uh, to do redemption, to provide redemption for us, but it wasn't just that. In fact, in Colossians chapter one, uh, it, it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Uh, in other places, in the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus is the exact representation of God. In other words, do you see what's happening? That the image of God in us was marred, and Jesus is that exact image. And the scripture says, yes, here's what I want you to do. I want you to become like Jesus. In other words, I want to restore the image of God in you through Jesus. That's what God's up to. That's what he's up to. You see, God's goal for your life and for mine is that we would become more like Jesus. And becoming more like Jesus is a part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, let me say a couple things. The first is you cannot become a disciple of Jesus on your own. You can't you can't become like Jesus on your own. Like, I made a decision, I prayed a prayer, got baptized, and now I'm gonna become like Jesus. It doesn't work that way. It, it is not something that you can do and produce on your own. Disciples aren't made in a vacuum. <laughs> They're made in a particular way. And we can look at the life of Jesus to find out how did Jesus make disciples? How did Jesus make disciples? And it's not done in a classroom setting. It's not done in another Bible study. It's not done in filling in the blanks on some outline. 
there's something to it. That, a number of years ago, um, I, my first ministry, I was in a youth ministry, and then I was in that for a couple years and found out that I was not a very good youth minister. And so then I started preaching. And I thought, that, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. And so I went to this little church in Kentucky. It's a little uh, country church. And when I went there, they had 85 people in attendance. And a couple years later, we were uh, grown it all the way to 60. <laughs> and I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and, but, but, you know, when it grew so small, I could take attendance uh, preaching. Like I, I, I could figure out who was there and who wasn't there just by looking at the room. And what I began to notice over a period of time was that there were like 50 people who were there every single week. Week in, week out, didn't make any difference. They were there all of the time. And of that 50, they were two distinct groups. There was a group of about 15 people. Uh, and then there was this group of about 35 people. And the difference was this, the group of about 15 people, they were growing like crazy. Like they were becoming like Jesus. And you could, I mean, it was just electrifying. Uh, and they were, they, and I thought, okay, so what's, what's up with the other 35 people? You know, I'm in my mid-20s and I'm, or my early 20s and I'm thinking, you know what? It's my, they, they hear the same sermon every week. So maybe, maybe it's the sermon. Maybe I need to preach with a little bit more oomph, you know, in it. And a little bit more challenge, a little bit, you know, I just need to, you know, rev it up a little bit. Maybe, maybe that'll get the other 35 going. And so I did that for a while. And guess what? Nothing. Uh, these were people who basically they just were checking a box when they came in. Yep, I've been to church and I'm going to go home. And then after a period of time, it dawned on me the difference between the two groups. Uh, and thankfully, it wasn't my sermons. It wasn't about me. What I realized is that the group of about 15 people, they were doing life together. They were in each other's homes. They were studying the Bible together. They were doing meals together. They were praying together. They were, they were like, they, they, were, they knew each other. They knew what was going on. They knew the struggles and the triumphs and the joys. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is remarkable. And that's when I realized um, when people get in relationship their spiritual growth goes through the charts. And so after a couple of years, I was called to a ministry down in Jacksonville, Florida, where I stayed for uh, 12 years. And what they wanted me to do, they wanted me to come down and start like small groups. And I'm like, I'm all over that because I've seen what it does in people. The impact of those relationships. You see, Following Jesus is something that is done in community with others. You cannot follow Jesus in isolation. You just can't. Following Jesus is something um, that when we're being changed by Jesus, it's something that happens in community with others. Like, you know, people attend services and conferences and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but they're not experiencing transformation. And the reason is because they're isolated relationally. They're isolated relationally. And accomplishing the mission of Jesus, it can't be done on your own. It takes everybody locking arms to accomplish the mission of Jesus. I can't accomplish the mission of Jesus. The staff at any one church can't accomplish the mission of Jesus. What's going to accomplish the mission of Jesus is for disciples of Jesus to say, he's Lord, I'm following him, I'm going to open up myself to be transformed by him, and I'm committing myself to his mission in life. And then we lock arms. And we support each other and we uh, go through life together and we're, we're lasered in on what Jesus is calling us to be and to do in this life. There's nothing about being a disciple of Jesus that is a solo sport. Where you just show up from time to time, you say hello, you talk to somebody in the lobby and then you go and you do your thing. That's not what being a disciple is all about. And by the way, Jesus did not call us to make converts and he did not call us to make Christians. He called us to make disciples. And that's a whole different ball game. Especially when you understand what Jesus meant when he was calling people to be a disciple. 
The word, the term disciple, I think I mentioned this maybe last week, the term disciple is mentioned almost 300 times in the New Testament. The term Christian, three times. And the term Christian is, uh, was used as a derogatory term about disciples who follow Jesus. And so, are you a disciple? And there are, there are some things that God uses. So how do we experience this transformation? There's some things, three things, primary things, or probably some other things, but there are three primary uh, ways, right, that God transforms us. He transforms us, and we're gonna look at this real quick, uh, real quickly, uh, through the word of God, through the people of God, and through the spirit of God. These three things, as you read through the New Testament, you will find this again and again and again. The Word of God, the people of God, uh, and the Spirit of God. And one great passage where all, you can see all of these things at work is in the very beginning of the church, Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 42. And this is what it says, that 3,000 people had responded to the gospel. They were baptized, more than that, actually. Uh, and so uh, after they celebrate all of that, it says in verse 44, uh, verse 42, speaking of those 3,000, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, notice these three things. Notice what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Jesus said, I want you to teach them everything I've commanded you. And so he would teach them. Uh, he told the, uh, the, the apostles, here's what the Old Testament scriptures taught about me. And as you read through the book of Acts, you will find the apostles teaching from uh, the word of God from the Old Testament. And then they go beyond that and start teaching about Jesus. And they would write letters. And they would send these letters out to the different churches. And those letters were under the inspiration of the spirit of God. And they became the word of God to the early church. And so when it says here that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, what they're saying is they devoted themselves to the word of God that was coming through the apostles. And the early church hung on that. And today we still hang on this. And so they devoted themselves to God's word. And then uh, these next two things, to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. Now, Scholars will, they, they have different ideas about what, this, uh, what these things represent. I have my opinion about this. I'm not going to dive into all of that today. It's nothing controversial, but it's just whatever this means to bring it up to a 30,000 foot view, whatever this is, it in, involves the gathering of the people of God. Like the early church was birthed and the people just didn't, you know, disappear. They stayed together. And as you read through the book of Acts, you find that, this, that there was transformation happening all over the place. Because they were devoted to one another in fellowship. The word fellowship there is koinonia. It just means a participation of, a relationship with. And so the breaking of bread at least means they were, meet, they were uh, eating meals together in each other's homes. They were doing life together. And the Spirit of God was, oh my, at work tremendously. And then it says uh, that they were devoted to prayer, where they're praying to the Lord. And the Lord is responding. In fact, in chapter uh, 4, the, it says that they, they started to pray, and the place where they were praying, calling out to God, the foundations of the building were shaken because God was responding. And so uh, you have all of this, the apostles teaching the word of God to the fellowship breaking of bread, the people of God, and to prayer, the spirit of God. And God is at work, and God is transforming them, and the church was on fire. They were reaching people and bringing people to faith in Jesus, and then when those people came to faith in Jesus, they made disciples. They discipled them and walked with them. They became a spiritual family, a spiritual unity. That's what they were doing. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul would do. Uh, he would devote his life, um, he would devote his life to the same kind of thing. What did Jesus do? Jesus comes to provide redemption, right? But it wasn't the only thing that he came to do because providing redemption is just one aspect of Jesus' mission. His other mission was to invest in the lives of 12 men, primarily. 
and then train them up so that they could take the message of redemption to the whole world and that they could make other disciples, other followers of Jesus. As you read through the gospels, you'll find that Jesus spent probably 80 to 90% of his time with the 12. Yes, he taught, performed miracles, but as you go through his life, as you look at that, he was, he was with his 12 men. They went everywhere together. It was in the context of relationship that Jesus built his disciples up. And then after three years, he turned them loose. And the world has never been the same. And again, I said this a couple weeks ago that uh, we take the message of Jesus and say, well, that's an inspired message. And then we decide, we think, hey, we've got a better way of doing church in our day. And the message of Jesus, listen, the message of Jesus is inspired, but so are his methods. And his methods were relationally based. He formed relationships with these people. And that's exactly what Paul does. Paul, the apostle, would go to uh, the church in Corinth and he would tell the church in Corinth, hey, here's what I want you to do. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. I want you to imitate me as I imitate Christ. I, I'm, I'm living my life to Jesus and I want you to look at my life, observe my life and imitate me. If you're gonna do that, you're gonna have to be in relationship with someone. He says over in uh, 1 Thessalonians, he planted a church in the city of Thessalonica and this is what he says to the people uh, at the church. He says this, although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles to you. Instead, we were gentle among you as a nurse nurtures her own children. We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Other translations say our souls. Because you have become dear to us. What's that? That's, that's the intimacy of relationship. Paul wasn't just coming in and, and doing night classes for people. He was living with them. He was pouring in. He knew them by name. They knew him by name. They, they talked together. They dreamed together. They, they spent their lives together. Where did he get that? He got that from Jesus because that's what Jesus did. And then he says in verse 11 of chapter 2, as you know, like a father with his own children, we have encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. In other words, when they saw, hey, here's the way to walk, walk in a way that honors God. Watch my life and how I try to honor God and mimic that. And so that's what he did. Um, Paul, he would say to Timothy, his son in the faith, he says, but you have followed my teaching my conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in various places. And what's he saying? Timothy, you've been right there. You've had a front row seat to my entire life. You know my heart. Why? Because we have been in relationship. This is the way. And then later on he would say, hey, just how I've trained you, I want you to uh, entrust the, this whole message to other faithful men who will then in turn give it to other men. That's what it means. You see, um, why, let me ask you this question. It's kind of obvious that disciple making needs to be the mission, the core mission of the church. Like number one at the top of the list, disciple making needs to be the core mission of the church. But why? Why? Well, Jesus said so. Yes, but it's more than that. It's more than that. And here's why. Disciple making is the method that God uses for making us like Jesus. That's why. Jesus said, hey, I want you to do exactly what I've done. I want you to make disciples the way I've made disciples. Because this is how people are transformed. Remember what we said, the image of God in us was martyred because of sin. And then the whole thing, Jesus said, hey, I want, I want you to be more like Jesus. And Jesus is the exact representation or image of God. 
And so Jesus comes and he says, look, it's not about a program. This is about life on life, relationship, helping people trust and follow Jesus with everything in them. And as they do, they make a decision to follow Jesus. They uh, are being changed by Jesus and they are joining the mission of Jesus. And this is what we all get invited into is being disciples of Jesus. And not just being disciples of Jesus, but what? Making disciples of Jesus. That's what we do. So here are a couple questions I want you to consider. Number one, how am I engaging with the Word of God? How am I, how am I engaging with the Word of God? Or do you have a time where you read the, God's Word, a chapter a day, and then, it's not just that. I mean, that's important. But are you engaging with the word of God with other believers, with other people who are, come back, come back, come back, one, one verse, on one, one slide. I know, it's, it's exciting. Are you engaging with other believers? Are you having conversations about God's word? Are you getting the perspective of other people, what God is, is saying to them and how he's changing them with the word of God? It's not about going to a class, it's about interacting with God's word. So how are you engaging personally and then uh, relationally with God's word? Next is how am I relating to the people of God? <clears throat> Does anyone know you? I mean, really know you outside of your immediate family? Is there any, is there any other um, disciple of Jesus who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus and joining the mission of Jesus, is there that kind of person who knows you? What makes you tick? What you're excited about? What your challenges are? What your weaknesses are? How they can encourage you? Does anybody know you like that? Because here's the thing. Jesus wants you to be transformed into his image. And he has given you other disciples, other believers in the body of Christ to help in that process. And when you just say, I'm good, I can show up, I can read the Bible on my own, I can listen to some podcasts and sermons and videos and all that, I, I, I got it. No, you can't. If you could, Jesus would have just held classes. He wouldn't have invested three years of his life with some disciples who quite honestly were quite frustrating from time to time. but he hung in there with them. And they were radically transformed as a result. So how are you relating to the people of God? And on the other side of that, how are you investing, how are you investing in other followers of Jesus? I mean, not just your family members, I mean other people, because that's what being a disciple is, it's making other disciples. Is there anybody that you're walking with in life to say, no, no, I, I'm, we're, we're in this together. I'm a disciple maker. And then finally, how, how am I cooperating with the Spirit of God? I mean, when, when you're in conversations with other people, when you're reading the scripture, when you're praying, and there's a conviction that comes over you because of something that you read, or maybe something that you feel like God is speaking into your heart, do you resist that? Do you say, no, I'm not going to do that? Or do you shut the Bible and say, I'm going to go on to something else? Or do you say, Lord, if you're leaning in on my heart or my spirit for whatever reason, if you're convicting me of something that I shouldn't do or something that I should be doing, then I'm going to say, yes, Jesus, please, please help me. Yes, I want to do that. Because you can resist the Holy Spirit. You can resist him. And when you do, your heart grows hard towards him. Don't let that happen. Don't just say, yes, Lord. Be obedient the first impulse. Be obedient the first time you read the verse or the passage in the Bible that says, hey, here's the thing. You say, okay, I may not understand it all, but I, you're, 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 I'm following you. You're, you're in the lead, not, not me. You wrote this book. I didn't. I don't get to, I, don't, I can't just say, well, it doesn't apply to me today. It doesn't apply. It's a different culture, different time. They did, Paul didn't know what he was talking about. Moses didn't know what he's, I'm not. No, it's the word of God. 
It's his word, not yours. He's your master. He doesn't obey you, you obey him. See? So are you, how are you with the Spirit of God? How are you with the Spirit of God? Um, last week, after the message, uh, there were five baptisms. One that we knew was coming, four people that we didn't know were coming. Because, um, and two of them were first time, they'd never been here before. They, they just said, hey, uh, we want to follow Jesus. And so we had a conversation with them, we baptized them. After the first service today, we knew one person was going to be baptized today, three more came forward. Yeah, three more came forward. Another one, another one that just, a young man just, he, he'd never been here before. And yet, he heard, he heard the message and he says, I want to follow Jesus. And I, you know, if that describes you, then, you know, we've got the baptistry right back there. It's warm water, jacuzzi for Jesus. <laughs> but you have to understand what, what's happening in our church. These aren't people who are saying, you know, I want to follow Jesus because he's going to make my life better and make me better at life. These are people who are saying, I'm laying, I'm crucifying myself. I'm taking up my cross. I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. I belong to him. He's my Lord. He's my King. And I'm saying, Lord, change me and I will join in your mission. That's what it means to be a disciple. Let's pray. Father, you are good. And I am so grateful for what you are doing in our church, all over the place, Lord. That we're not here just to play around and just to, you know, have a social environment, a social club, but that we're here to say, Jesus, you are king. Heaven and hell are real. Eternity is real. And all of us someday stand before you. And God, we want in that day to be called uh, faithful to your calling. We want to hear those words from your lips, well done, good and faithful service, servant. And so, Father, I pray uh, that for those of us who've been kind of nibbling around the edges, that we would just lay all of those things aside and just say, you are my Lord. I'm going to follow you. I'm making a decision of my head. I, I'm, I'm, I'm making this willful decision. I know who you are and I want to follow you. And that we invite you to change us from the inside out of heart transformation. And then, Lord, that we would, in, um, we would embrace the mission of Jesus. That we would embrace uh, what he's calling all of us to do as followers of his. And that is to make disciples of everyone we come into contact with. Father, we pray that you are honored with our response. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.